nation welcome welcome to the lighthouse church listen guys we are so excited to have you here with us today listen the first thing i want to do is number one tell you good morning right i don't want to be rude but then i also want to thank you for joining us we're here at our north campus my question for you is where are you put that in the comments let us know where you're watching from let us know how excited you are to be here. Put your favorite emoji in the chat. We're excited to see you. Listen, we appreciate you guys, and we're glad that you're joining with us today. I think I see some people here in the building that are from LH Nation, our online campus. If y'all in here, make some noise. No? I, say, I hear somebody somewhere in here from LH Nation. Guys, clap for them if you're sitting next to someone that represents LH Nation from our online campus. Make them feel welcome. Speaking of, guys, y'all know LH Nation is expansive, right? We have our North Campus, which is where we are today. We have our South Campus. We have our West Campus. We even have our Southeast Campus. And of course, we have our online campus. So guys, listen. If you're connected to any one of those campuses, you are, of course, what we call a partner to LH Nation. And again, we want to express our appreciation for you. Now, y'all know, here at the Lighthouse, we are in the 13th year. And this is what we're calling the year of manifested promises. Now, for April, we're starting a new month, of course. And guess what? It is the month of perspective. That's going to be our promise for this month. So that's what I want you to be thinking around. That's what I want you to be listening and looking for in your life is perspective. Now, the scripture that we're going to be using for this month is Genesis 13 and 15. It says, all the land that you see, I will give to you and your descendants forever. Now, y'all know when we do the promise, we also have a declaration that goes with it. And I want you to open up your ears. I want you to get your fingers ready online. People in the building, I want your ears and minds and hearts open to be able to hear this promise. And then I want you to repeat it. I want you to declare it over your own life. Here it is. I have perspective and it will never end. Guys, that's valuable because if everything that you see is going to be given to you and your descendants forever, you're going to want to have that perspective. So, Type that in the chat. I have perspective and it will never end. Come on, y'all. Make some noise. Type it in the chat. 
Put your clapping emojis in the chat, guys. We're glad to see and have you here. Guys, are y'all ready for our Easter experience? That's going to be next Sunday. Let me let you know where we're going to be for that. We're not going to be here. We won't be at the North Campus because we're planning on doing it big. We're going to pack and fill up the George R. Brown Convention Center right here in Houston, Texas. That's next Sunday at 10 a.m. You don't have to register. You don't need a ticket. You just need to show up, pack that building out, and come worship with us. We're going to have a worship service for the adults. Adults, we're going to have Tamala Mann, who's going to worship with us. But guess what? We did not forget about the children. Our Kids Discovery Zone, what we call our KDZ, they're going to have a whole worship service themselves. They're going to have Easter egg hunts, popcorn, candy, face painting. They'll have a worship service. So, guys, you don't want to miss that. Please make sure that you get connected to that and join us for that. Don't forget to join us the day before. That's going to be April 8th. On that Saturday, we're going to have our L.A.'s Nation homecoming. It's going to be a mass baptism. If you want to get baptized, meet us here on April 8th, and we'll do baptism. We'll meet and fellowship with people from all over that are part of L.A.'s Nation and our online campus. So, again, connect to that event. We definitely cannot wait to see you. Also, we keep it going, right? We always have a lot of things going on. For example, I want you, if you can, to meet our very own Lady Shawnee in Dallas at the Potter's House. She's going to be a part of the Legends and Lilies brunch. So if you have time, if you have availability, go get in that space, go and get in that atmosphere. I'm almost sure it's going to be incomparable to anything that you've experienced. There's going to be a lot of wisdom in that room. Now, I don't know what it looks like on your screen, but here in the room for me, I see a lot of blue. If you got on blue, make some noise. Come on, let me hear it. If you got on blue, so if you hear all that noise, that means a lot of people have on blue. And the reason why we do is because we are recognizing Autism Awareness Month. And I want to just share a few facts with you. Number one, one in 36 can be identified with the Autism Spectrum Disorder, otherwise known as ASD. Now, it occurs in all racial, ethnic, and economic statuses. So there's no discrimination with that, right? Now, Here's a key fact. The earlier the diagnosis and the services received, the better the outcome. And this brings me to my next point. I want to share and get some information and interaction from one of our guests on the pre-show today, Ms. Nisha Ford. Come on out, come on out. House, come on, Lighthouse, everybody clap, clap, clap for Ms. Nisha Ford. Y'all a little quiet this morning. What's going on, Lighthouse? They quiet, right? They a little quiet. They a little I, quiet. I they think, a little quiet. Wait, wait, wait. I think I know why they quiet. Because what we have done for the autistic awareness is we brought the sound down, we Absolutely. brought the lights down, so it maybe calms everybody else down too. So Absolutely. that's another thing that we're doing to help recognize autism, autism awareness. But I wanna ask you a few questions. Okay. Because I think that you have a lot of knowledge that you can share with us about this. Absolutely. And so what, from your perspective and experience, what is the most important thing to know um, in regards to autism awareness? So I would think that, um we always refer autism to children, yes. and just because you see someone's child that's maybe having a tantrum or that's looking like they're doing something that they shouldn't, don't judge them. That, that child may have some type of sensory deficit. Ask them if you can help them. Ask them if there's anything that you can do. Don't just walk, don't just judge them. Okay. So, um, personal experience, I know, um, and I could be speaking from other people's experience, sometimes when you see that, like you say, you may judge, think the child is acting out, or you may, may want to approach, may not know how to. So if someone does want to offer some help and assistance, what is, what kind of way, or what's the best way to offer help in any of those type of situations? I often see people in the supermarket or the store, their child's crying, just going haywire. I don't know what's wrong. So I'll just right. say, hey, excuse me, brother. Excuse me, sister. Is there something I can do to help you? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Or just say, it's okay. I have two at home. I have, you have five at home. I have five. Yes. <laughs> so just offer them that, just letting them know that you care and that comfort right. that whatever's going on with their child is okay. Yeah. But very soft, very kind, yeah. and with <laughs> go with God. You got to have the heart for it, right? Absolutely. Because it's definitely a delicate situation. You don't know who would be offended. Like, mind your business. You know what I mean? Don't be asking me how you can help me. I don't need none of your help. None of that. Some, it happens, y'all. I mean, people, you know, the public is a very scary place sometimes. It is. So you have to have a lot of courage and really have the heart for people to do something like that. Um, we were talking earlier, and you used this word stemming. 
And it was very interesting to me. And I, I think it'll be good information to even share with the public and share with our listeners online and our watchers online. Can you explain to us like what stimming is and how does that work? Okay, uh, stimming, S-T-I-M-M-I-N-G. It is something that individuals, children on the spectrum do. It's repetitive behaviors. Yes. It may look very annoying. It may look very unorthodox to the right like to the naked eye by you just walking up to somebody and they're doing this or making the same repetitive sound or motion. But it's something that children with autism, adults with autism do to help decrease their sensory stimulation. Okay, okay. And that's awesome. Now, and I'm glad you spelled that out because when I wrote it in my notes, I, S-T-E, <laughs> but it's S-T-I-M-M-I-N-G. And see that, and that's great and that's amazing. So it's stemming something that I can use, not just only be aware of. Like I heard you said before, like if I were to repeat the same statement mm -hmm. over and over to them, that could also help them calm down or same type of motion or something yes. like that. So remember, autism is a sensory deficit disorder. Yes, ma'am. Everybody with autism is different. So my son, I don't know exactly what the deficit is. However, I know that sometimes if I say something to him, he may not get it. So I may repeat it or write it down. Yes. So just repeat it, be patient. And if they're saying something, they may be trying to get your attention to let you know something. So let's hear what they're saying, listen to them, and just be cognizant of what other things are around them that could be triggering them to do that. Awesome, okay. Well guys, listen, we're getting ready to start service, so like, share, comment, and subscribe to Keon Henderson TV. We'll see you in worship. We love you guys. There's nothing you can do about it. Peace. Happy Sunday. Here to give God some praise. Acceptance, you will find it here. Authenticity in this atmosphere. Anticipation with a lot of action. We take it so far. Welcome to the lighthouse, lighthouse. Let me introduce you to my father. Welcome to the lighthouse, lighthouse. His name is Jesus the Christ. Jesus made room for us when he went to the cross. Because if you remember at first, uh, it was Judaism and the church only had room uh, for the Jews. But God, when he died on the cross and got out of the grave on the third day morning, he made room for the Gentile. And so now there's no more male or female, no more Jew nor Gentile, no more slave nor free, but we're all one in Jesus Christ. And so he made room for us and we're making room for you, which is why we took the service from the Lighthouse North where we knew we wouldn't have any room and we're going to the George R. Brown. It's going to be amazing. Tamala Man is coming. Uh, we will be there at the GRB. Uh, for Easter Sunday on the 9th, service starts at 10 o'clock. Good morning, Lighthouse. Good morning in this place. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. If you know that you serve a risen Savior, won't you get up and rise on your feet this morning? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Lift up your heads. O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. Lift up the doors of your heart and receive the King of glory. If he is your King of glory, won't you give him your best praise in this place? Hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Lighthouse, Lighthouse Nation, 
I need you to open up your mouths and give God the best praise that you have on this morning. And I need you to look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, let them on in. Come on, clap your hands like this. Everybody, everybody just clap your hands. Listen. Mighty warrior, great in battle, you've already won. My defender, no contender, you've already won. And I will lift up my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. Hey, 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 for the Lord is my shield and my fortress I fear no one no one no one let the king of glory let the king of glory oh, oh, oh. let the king of glory let the king of glory let the king of glory
they sing. Hallelujah is the highest praise. No matter what it looks like, if you open up your mouth and say hallelujah. Come on, Nick. We sing. Right here, sing it. Open up your mouths right here. Don't you dare be quiet. Open up your mouths right here. Why? Because we want him to dwell in this place. We want him to dwell in our hearts, in our minds, in our homes. Dwell right here. Lift your voices. Don't get quiet on me. Lift your voices. Lift your voices. Lift your voices. Lift your voices. Hey. You see, if you know it, sing it. You are our hearts. One desire. Y'all say, thirsty for you. Yeah. Thirsty for you. Everybody say, you are one desire. Only you can set it. Only you can set it. Come on, y'all, come in and say, say you are one desire. I am thirsty for you. I am thirsty for you. Oh, you are one desire. Only you can say it. Yeah, only you can say this. Give him some harmony. for you Jesus first day
hearts are raised. We wait on you. Let's just stay in that worship moment right now. Understand that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, that love is patient. So as the praise and worship team was singing, we wait on you. Well, guess what? God is waiting on you. In fact, the Bible says that God is slow to anger. And then he's merciless. So what God does, he slows down his anger to speed up his patience. In other words, God can't wait to wait on you. And so as we prepare for prayer, and as the prayer warriors have consecrated themselves, guess what? We're waiting on you. Because patience is a sign of love. The things I love, I'm going to wait for. So as you come right now, we just pray that God will speak into your heart the very thing that you need to hear. We are praying right now, God, that your spirit and your power will be made manifest, Lord Jesus. And some of you may even feel unworthy. Some of you may feel like you may not be able to come up here because of what you did or what you've done. But let me tell you something, God is slow to anger. God has already forgiven you. So just come on up, connect with one of these prayer warriors. Allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. Don't let the devil have you sit in that seat. Come on up and allow God to speak into your heart, into your mind, into your soul. Your breakthrough is in the house today. The very thing you've been waiting on. See, some of y'all have been waiting all week. I'm going to keep talking about this waiting thing. Some of y'all have been waiting all week to get here. You may not be able to pray at your house. You may not be able to pray at your job, but let me tell you something. You can pray right here. You can come to meet the Lord right here. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you. We honor you in this moment right now, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that you have decided to dwell with us, Lord God. Father God, the word says that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And so, Father, if you died for us in our worst state, Lord God, what more will you do for us even now? Father, I pray right now for your deliverance. I pray right now for your power. I pray right now, Lord God, for your healing, Lord Jesus. I pray right now for your provision right now. Somebody in here feels like they're at the end of themselves. Somebody feels like that they've ran out of chances. Somebody feels like they've messed up too many times. But let me tell you something, God, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. There is still grace available for you. As long as you are breathing, as long as you are able to stand, as long as you are able to open your eyes and see, there is grace available for you. Father, we thank you even right now that you're working it out. We thank you, Lord God, that, Father, in the midst of our situation, Father, when we can't see the way out, you've already made a way out, God. We want to thank you for just being a way maker, Lord God. We want to thank you, Lord God, that when we don't have the money, that we don't have the resources, when we don't have the friends, and we can't call the family, Father, if we can call on you, God, we know that you'll transform it. We know that you'll change it. We know that you'll make everything all right, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord God, because your presence is here. I don't know about y'all, but I feel his presence. His presence is right here. And take advantage of his presence right now. There is something that God is even telling y'all online right now to the people online. Even though you may not be able to be at this altar, you have an altar in your living room. You have an altar in your bedroom. You have an altar in your kitchen. Even if you're at work and you're unable, go to the bathroom. Make that an altar. 
And if you're unable to do that, you can still make an altar in your mind and in your heart. And just bow down to God. And lay all your cares. And lay all your troubles. And lay all your burdens down on him. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Lord, we thank you that you waited on us. Even when we wasn't coming. We thank you that you waited on us. We thank you, Lord God, for your patience with us, Lord God. Some of us, it, it didn't, some of us didn't get it the first time, God. Some of us didn't get it the second time. Some of us didn't get it the tenth time. But we thank you, Lord God, that you waited years for us to get it right. And we just give you glory right now, Jesus. We thank you for your blood that covers us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that any situation that we go through and anything that we experience, your blood can take care of. We thank you that we overcome you by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, Father. And since you already shed, our blood, shed your blood, Lord God, all we need to do is just give our testimony. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the testimony. We thank you, Lord God, for, for the times that we couldn't find a way out that you brought us out. We thank you, Lord God, for the times where we couldn't deliver ourselves, Lord God. You came in and you saved us, Father. We thank you, Lord God, for all the times, Lord God. We didn't have the money, but you gave us the favor, Lord God. We thank you for all the times, Lord God, where, where we thought we were going to lose the house. We thought we were going to lose the car. We thought we were going to lose the apartment. We thought we were going to lose the friend. We thought we were going to lose the job. But, Father, you came in and you worked things out. And we want to say thank you, God. Father, we give you glory in advance, Lord God. Father, we, everything may not be where we want it right now. But God, we just praise you in advance. We lift you up in advance right now, Lord God. We give you glory in advance for the opportunity. We give you glory in advance for the provision. We give you glory in advance for the deliverance. We give you glory in advance, Lord God, for working it out. We give you glory in advance for the restoration, Lord God. We give you glory in advance, Lord God, for how you're working things out in our heart, Lord God. We give you glory in advance, Lord Jesus, because there is none like you anywhere, Lord God. And we want to say thank you, Jesus. We pray with a thankful heart, Lord God, because our gratitude is how we see you. And so, Father, help us not to miss you in this moment, Lord Jesus. Help us to see you for who you are, Lord God. You are El Shaddai. You are Elohim, Lord God. You are El Elyon, Lord God. You are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, Lord Jesus. You are Jehovah Rapha, Lord God. You are Jehovah Shammah, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for everything that you are, Father. And if I could just get like Moses for a minute, and I could say, God, you are the I am that I am. So anything that I need, Father, you are, Lord God. And we just want to thank you, Lord God, for being everything, being everything that we need, Lord Jesus. Father, when we needed a comforter, you are a comforter. Father, when, you, when, when we needed just somebody just to listen to us, Lord God, when no one else will listen to us, that's what you are. You are that listening ear, Lord God. We thank you for being a provider. We thank you for showing up, Lord God, when no one else was able to show up. We give you glory, Lord God, and we honor you, Father, in this moment, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your power. Father, there are times in this life where we feel weak. Even as Christians, we feel weak, and we don't know how we're going to make it through, and we don't know where we're going to turn. And we've prayed about it tens of times, hundreds of times, thousands of times. And, and it seemed like we weren't able to get the breakthrough yet. But God, you're patient. <laughs> you're patient. You're patient. You love us. You care about us, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Father, for doing it right now. We thank you for doing it even right now, Father. I just pray, Lord, that as you continue to move in this atmosphere, Lord God, that your spirit would continue to speak. 
And we claim all these blessings, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. and put your hands together. Well, you can do better than that for the Lord. If you really love him, just come on, put just a little bit more effort. Because the Lord did it for you. Couldn't nobody else do it? But, you, but the Lord, come on. Clap your hands like it was only him. Yeah. Yeah, he went past all of your strength and did what you could not do. Come on, you can be seated in the house of the Lord. If there's any first time guests in the house that's visiting with us this morning, just, just lift your hand up, just lift your hand. Oh my God, look at that. Come on, Lighthouse, let's make it real big for them. Listen. Clap for them first time guests like you know this is going to be the only time they visit. That by the time next Sunday come, they're going to be in the house. Amen. Listen, just for all those who are watching us online, we just want to welcome you in Lighthouse Nation. We want to welcome you into the Lighthouse Church worship. We love you guys. And if there's any Lighthouse Nation visiting with us today, just, just lift your hand up. Anybody just out of town that came, there it is, there it is, there are a few hands. There are a few hands. We want to welcome you into the service. We see you with us. Listen, I know you've heard this many times before, right? That the Lighthouse Church, we communicate with the body of Christ through five, what we call the five A's. The first one is anticipation. And like the song said, we've been waiting for you to come into the room. So since you're in the room, we, was, we just want to encourage you just to enjoy everything that's going on, everything that you see, every song that's sung. Because not only have we been anticipating for you to come and enjoy the worship service with you, we want to make sure that the atmosphere is what you need. And when you come inside the Lighthouse Church, I promise you, first time guests and all those who've been with us for years, you're going to, say, you're going to experience the same spirit to look like. If you want to wear your dress long and put your stockings underneath, then we want to make sure that we accept you however way you come. Now, I know some of us don't like to wear the stockings, but if you do, we accept you. You can put your church hat on. You can put your Jordans on, your distressed jeans, whatever shirt you want to put on, and however mindset you come in, I promise that by the time you get in here with this atmosphere, your mind, whatever perspective you have, it's going to change anyway. You know why it's like that? Because we're authentic to who we are. We're authentic. Our leader, nobody else like him in the world. Authentic to who he is. We're authentic throughout this entire church that when you come in here, you're going to feel the realness. Ain't nothing fake around here. We're going to love you. We don't judge you. And if you're broken, we're going to help you heal. If you need a hug, we'll give that to you. If you need to run with somebody, well, I do a lap with you. But we're authentic to who we are. So if you come in here, we want to love you. And hopefully you've been feeling that love if you've been with us in an amount of time. Also, we're a church of action. We take action. That we don't wait, we don't sit back on our hands, we go get it. And if you sit next to a go-getter, just shake them and say, you a go-getter? Yeah, we take action. We take action around here. We build businesses, we, we build homes, we give to the poor, we, we, we help the community. We take action around here. If this is your church, put your hands together for that. Now, this is the year of manifested promises. And I know there's a few of you who've been experiencing some of those promises as we've been speaking and declaring those things throughout the month. Well, this month, I want you to repeat after me, said this is the year of manifested promises. And I have the right perspective. Woo, you better know that perspective means something. Look at what the scripture said, Genesis 13 and 15, says that the land that you see, I'm giving to you and your descendants. You got to have the right perspective to receive that. That if you, don't, if you don't have the right perspective, you'll miss all the land that the Lord has set up for you. But I want to ask that the Lord not only circumcise our heart, but our eyes too. That I'll be able to see what it is that the Lord has for me. Look at your neighbor and say, I want to see 
what the Lord has for me. Woo, you better get your eyes right, girl, because you about to walk into something that the Lord has built for you. Can't nobody do it. But the Lord, I feel running in my feet right about there, but I got to move on. Hallelujah. Listen, we have, we have some great things coming up. We have some great things coming up for you. Now, I want you to listen real good. Circumcise your ears now, because I don't want to say this two times. I want, you to, I want you to listen real good. Look, this coming Saturday, April the 8th, say it, April the 8th, we're having our first mass baptism of the year. Who put your hands together? There it is on the screen. Listen, if you want to get baptized, if you want to, just, if you want to go into that water, our leader's going to be here with our campus pastors and some of our ministers, and we're going, to, we're going to baptize you. We'll take you right on in there, into that water. Now, if you want to do it, this might be your sixth or seventh time. But it don't matter. We're going to baptize you anyway. And if you come up there, you can get in there with your clothes on. You can get in there with your baptism clothes on. Get in your shoes. Get your hat messed up. We're going to do all of that for you if you just want to come down here to this baptism. And we plan on baptizing not hundreds, but thousands if we can. And if you want to come here with us, come on over here. Get in that water with us. Some of us need it anyway. Amen? Amen. Listen, on April the 9th, say April the 9th. Now, April the 8th was baptism, but April the 9th, that's Sunday. That's Sunday. There it is right there. He look real good on that screen, don't he? It's April the 9th. That's Easter Sunday. And you've been hearing Pastor talking about we've been making room, right? Yeah. The Lord made room for us through the resurrection and the death on the cross. But we made room by going down to George R. Brown Convention Center on April the 9th at 10 a.m., and we're going to take the entire George R. Brown Convention Center over. Say, we're going to do it the lighthouse way. Say, that's lighthouse, baby. That's lighthouse. We're going to take the whole George R. Brown over. Now, I know we're only in one room, but we're going to take all of it. <laughs> Say, Hall B. Hall B. Don't you forget that letter. Because that's where we'll be. Hall B is where we'll be. Hall B for, for the uh, Easter service on April the 9th. Now, we didn't forget our babies, because not only are we going to have Easter service for us in George R. Brown, but we got some plans special for our babies. <laughs> Scan that QR code, get yourself in there, because listen, we're going to have such a Holy Ghost time in Hall B, in Hall A, they're going to be having fun. Yeah. They're going to have an Easter egg hunt, they got bounce houses, zip lines, all kind of stuff going on in Hall A. Now say Hall A, that's where the action is. Say Hall B, is where we'll be. Yeah, now don't get you confused. Now zip line ain't for you. Yeah, yeah, Hall A is for the children. But if you still got a kid in you and you got a kid at heart, maybe I go to a zip, you'll do your zip line before you come to worship. But Hall B is where we'll be. Now listen, this is for those who might just want to come to experience a little worship. Todd Gabbath is bringing Encounter Nights Tour to Houston. This is going to be Wednesday, April the 12th at 7 p.m. But listen, we got a special promotion for you because it says uh, they are giving the first 50 people who buy a general admission ticket 10% off using the promo code Lighthouse at checkout. The concert is going to be right here at the Lighthouse Church, April the 12th at 7 p.m. And if you want to get 10% off of your ticket, use the Lighthouse promo code. But you got to be within the first 50. The first 50 people get that discount 10% off if you lose the promo code Lighthouse. Lastly, but surely not least, meet our First Lady, Lady Shine. in Dallas, Texas, Saturday, April the 15th, at the Potter's House for Legends and Lily's Brunch, blooming into her, hosted by Lady Sarita Jakes, at the Potter's House, April the 15th, in Dallas. Please, if you want to go to that, scan that QR code right there. you get all the information that you need. Meet our first lady down there. Show a little support. We got the best in the land, right? Listen, this is Autism Month. And if you look around the sanctuary, we've painted the sanctuary blue. 
If you got your blue on, put your hands together. Got my blue on. Yeah, got my blue, my tennis shoe, everything. I feel like I'm looking good. And, 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 but we got a few autism facts. Number one, autism spectrum disorder is one of the fastest growing developmental disorders in the United States. ADS is more common than childhood cancer, diabetes, and AIDS combined. Autism is four times more common among boys than among girls. Autism is not an illness. It's something you're born with. Signs of autism might be uh, noticed when you're, when you're very young or not until you're older. If you're autistic your whole life, autism is not a medical condition with treatments or a cure. Children with ASD can learn and succeed in the classroom and beyond. Like every child, with the help of other families, doctors, specialists, and communities, a kid with autism can thrive. Listen, just for the support of Autism Month, just put your hands together for those whom you know have been serving those with autism or who has been living with the gift of autism. Just put your hands together for them. Just take a few moments. We have a few more announcements we want to give to you. Just give attention to the screen, and then the worship team will be right back out with you. Yo, what's up, family? It's your boy, Ty Galbraith, and I am excited. As a matter of fact, I'm beyond excited because I'm coming to your house, Lighthouse, on April the 12th. We are bringing Encounter Nights to the building. Now, listen, I need you guys to be in the building. It's, it's going to be a night to remember, not because I'm going to be there, but because the king of all kings is going to be there. I promise you, this is not a tour, but this is a night for miracles, a night for prayer, a night for God to answer questions a night for God to heal bodies. I am believing that this will be a night to remember. So please go today to TyGalbert.com. Get your tickets. Tell your cousin. Tell your mama. Tell your auntie. They don't want to miss it. Encounter Nights are coming to Houston. And we're going to be at your church. I'm excited. Thank you, Pastor Keon. Thank you, Pastor Shani, for allowing us to bring Encounter to your house. I can't wait. See you guys April 12th. Black men are dying from preventable diseases. You can be part of the solution. Come out to TSU on Saturday, April 15th at 7 a.m. for the annual African American Male Wellness Walk. Walk for your dad, brother, husband, son, uncle, and yourself. This is a free family event with kids entertainment, free health screenings, and more. Scan the QR code for more details, and we'll see you 7 a.m. Saturday, April 15th at TSU, walking to save black men's lives. At my campus, you are leadership. You are excellence. I feel like my teachers support me. They tell me I can be whatever I want. I want to go to the NFL. I want to take pictures when I grow up. I want to own my own business. Each student that comes through our doors is a unique individual. They want to know the way you like to learn, and they will do their best to put that in their lesson. They all care about your education. They can see the potential inside of you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, what you just saw is a promotion uh, for our new uh, initiative starting this coming fall. Uh, the Lighthouse Church and the Dream Center will be opening up uh, its official school uh, for K-5 all the way through fifth grade. Come on and praise God for that. Come on, you can do better than that. You can do better than that. Um, this, has been, this has been a vision, it's been a dream, and so um, the first time we attempted to do it, um, COVID hit and, and disrupted those plans, but I believe that we're going to get it right this time. I believe we have the right team, and I want to introduce, you, uh, introduce to you a very, very important element of that team, Dr. Erica Johnson, who is the superintendent and executive vice president of Ignite Community School. Come on and praise God for Ms. Johnson. Good morning. So, Ms. Johnson, just kind of tell the people who are watching online and those who are in the room what we got. Thank you for having me, Pastor. So, I am so, so very excited to announce this wonderful partnership and opening of Ignite Community School, Humble, in the Dream Center right next door. Yeah, clap for that. 
My name is Dr. Erica Johnson. I am the proud superintendent of Ignite Community Schools under the direction of Responsive Education Solutions housed in Louisville, Texas. But I wanted to take an opportunity to share with you your pastor's vision that he shared with us. And so with that, he says, when we started the Lighthouse Church, we started with a vision. One of the pillars was that every evolving dream was to house three generations, Gen Z, Millennials, and Boomers, all on one campus at one time. We accomplished the middle pillar by acquiring our worship facility. We hope to achieve the third pillar in the future by building a senior living facility on campus. But as of today, we've come one step closer to realizing the total vision by housing and supporting the Ignite Community School Humble in our brand new state-of-the-art facility, the Dream Center. And so we look forward to a rich partnership where we are committed to serving families and children right here on this campus. And to start things off, April 20th through 22nd, parents, if you have a child that is kinder through fifth grade, jot this down, April 20th, 21st and 22nd, we will have an open enrollment event just for Lighthouse. So if you're interested, we want to see you at the Dream Center April 20th through 22nd. We even added a Saturday just for convenience. Thank you, Pastor. So before Ms. Johnson, give her a hand. Give her a hand. It seems like every time God does something for us, he blows our mind. So we built this building, we put the classrooms in it, we put the gymnasium in it, we did the cafeteria, it's got a commercial kitchen in it, we've got all of that stuff. And the day we open this school, we're already bigger than the building. Come on and praise God. So if you get an opportunity on your way out, and you'll see um, the progress that's taking place. The reason why it's taking so long is we're actually having to bring in modular buildings uh, to already house the amount of students that are coming in. So this is why it's important for you not to wait to the last minute because I know you think that because you go to church here, it should be ready anytime you're ready, but this is for the community. And I want us to get in our mind that the Lighthouse Church is no longer just those of us who sit in the seats. The Lighthouse Church is the Lighthouse Nation, and God called us to this entire region to serve every person who needs the message of God. So we're going to bring in module uh, rooms. We're going to have um, extra rooms on the outside of the building. Uh, we're building uh, all kinds of things. And here's my vision. I can just give it to you right now. You, I, I really want to build a building on this campus that looks like main event. And I want our children to be able to have those types of experiences right here on this campus, but then I want to rent it to everybody else while we ain't at church and have another revenue stream. There should be a hotel in this area. There should be a restaurant in this area. There should be a grocery store in this area. There should be a senior living facility in this area. And we can do it. Touch your name and say, we can do it. But we have to believe it. And so this is one step uh, in that direction. And I want you praying for this woman because she has a monumental task ahead of her to make sure that people believe that in this side of the city, you can get an education that is representative of excellence, amen, amen. and where the Holy Spirit rules the building. Amen. Come on and praise God for Ms. Johnson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Before the praise team comes back, I want to introduce you to somebody. The reason why this is, this is crazy that this is happening on this day so when I was growing up, um, my mother and my sisters and I, we lived in Gary, Indiana. Uh, but we, some people from Gary in here? Yeah, that's what's up. So, so we were, but we would drive to East Chicago to go to high school. 
uh, because the school system in the city that I grew up in, it, it just, it was non-existent. I believe when I was growing up, there may have been seven or eight high schools. If you go back to the city that I grew up in right now, there's only one open. All of the high schools that were open when I was growing up are now closed. Even the one that I was supposed to go to is now closed. Um, all of the elementary schools that I went to are now closed. Um, but, but there was a man um, who God put in our life. He was the basketball coach for the school that I went to. And we didn't have suitable transportation at the time. He would drive me from East Chicago back to Gary, back to my house. And even when I was able to get a basketball scholarship and go to a division one university, this man, because we didn't have the transportation, drove me to meet my coach at the first meeting, drove me to my first practice uh, until my mother could get together and send me to go to college. And he's in this building today. I want you to praise God for Mr. Bobby Miles. Could you stand coach? This is my high school basketball coach. And I'll never forget the words that he told me. Um, our senior, my junior year, we only lost one game. And that game was in the, the game that would have sent us to the championship. The next year, we lost two games. And we had nine players on our team, all went division one. And um, I wasn't the best player on the team. I, I would never pretend that I was. But I do know uh, he said something to me that I, that I kept in my heart all of my life. He said, Keon, you were not the best player on that team, but you were absolutely the most coachable player that I've ever had. And let me tell you something. You might not be the best at something, but if you listen better than the people who are better, you can get much further. Touch your name and say, become a listener. And I want you to start off by listening to praise and worship. So stand on your feet. They're gonna sing one more song and I'm gonna come back with the word of God. Pure and true. Father, we bless you. We bless your name. We stand in awe of who you are. Your love towards us is beautiful, and we reverence you for that.
So I love sing to you. We sing oh, oh, oh. There are no words. There's nothing left. So I love sing to you. Never 
never be, I'll never be. Praise Him, let Him have it. With just one. tell you what's happening right now. So this is, for us, this is Autism Awareness Month, so we observe it. We don't just observe it in color. We observe it, observe it in function. So all of the lights that we have, they're all cut off because it's sensory detail. The sound system has been turned down in half 
because of sensory detail. And what's happening is, is you can't find your sweet spot because you've been depending on lights and sound. I know what's happening. You're, like, you're feeling like something's off. So it's not as exciting as it is. No, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's not as exciting as it is. It's that you've been depending on other things to get you into the presence of God. I need somebody in here to remember when we didn't have no LED screens in church, when we didn't have any lights, when the sound system was manned by a volunteer that was also the janitor, and we went to the presence of God and still gave him glory. I need somebody who worshiped him in HEB this week. I need somebody who worshiped him at a red light last month. Is there anybody in the room today that understands that who the Son has set free is free indeed. I need a real worshiper, and they that worship him will worship him not with lights, not with sound, but in worship. They will worship him in spirit and in truth. I need 2,000 people to open up your mouth online and in this place and begin to give God the worship. Come on, I can't hear nobody. I can't hear nobody. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun, he's worthy. Come on, touch your neighbor. You're one word away. You're one word away. You're one. It might be hallelujah. It might be thank you, Jesus. It might be Lord, help me. It might be I'm stressed out. It might be I'm at the end of my rope. It might be I'm about to cut somebody out. But whatever the word is, speak it. Yesterday, yesterday I was um, at the Final Four game. They cheer better for their teams than you do for your God. They were in uniform too. They all had the same color on. It was a little different. They shouted for every shot, every pass. People on the bench, they didn't even get in the game, but they was clapping. And here we are in the presence of the King of Kings on the same team, in the same uniform, acting like it's normal to get this far. I don't know about you, but somebody ought to praise God because if you think about where you should have been and compare that to where you actually are, my soul doth magnify the Lord. in this place. Make your presence felt. Move your weight around. And he that has an ear, let him hear 
what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name we pray. If you love him, come on and say amen. Joshua chapter number one. Verse number one. I'll be reading in the New English translation of the Bible, so it may read slightly different than yours. The Bible says in the book of Joshua, chapter one, verse one, it says, and after Moses, the Lord's servant died, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, who was Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Some of y'all got some dead things in your life. Either dead or dying. Or should die, but you keep bringing it back to life. And anytime something dies in your life, you have a responsibility to do what God tells Joshua next. Are you ready? This is what he tells him. It's dead. You're mourning, get ready. Because anytime something leaves your life, God is expecting you to do something. And you're probably going, especially if that person was close to you, their responsibilities have now become yours. Do what I was telling Moses to do. You get ready to cross the Jordan. And what he was doing, you're going to have to do. You lead these people into the land which I am ready to hand over to you. Do you know how many things God is ready to give you if you would just get ready? He says, I am handing over to you every place you have the courage to step on. And I'm not doing it because I like your walk. I'm doing it because I told Moses I would. There's some of you all about to get a blessing in this dispensation of your life because he promised your Moses, your mama, your daddy, your mom, your grandmama, your TT, young somebody. He promised somebody while they were praying in the midnight hour and you were acting crazy and the Lord wouldn't let nothing happen to you when you was in the club knowing you were supposed to be at home. He would, because he, he promised somebody, he said, I'm going to take care of them. They're going to act a fool, they gonna, but I still got anybody, anybody a product of that kind of grace? He says, every place your foot, this is, I'm going to read it in the King James Version because some of us old school, everywhere your foot shall tread. Yeah, I knew because it's, it's something about the language. Every, everywhere your foot shall tread. Now, if you read it in the King James Version of the Bible, it says that it has already been given. So here's how we think in the natural. We think we step and he gives. We step and he gives. God says, no, no, it's all your hoofs. So wherever you step. Just do me a favor, everybody shout, all is mine. But you're going to have to do something. I know you've been praying on it. I know you've been thinking on it. I know you've been fasting on it. God told me to tell you, it ain't gonna happen. 
until you step on it. High five three people. You can reach them front, back, side, and tell them, step on it. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I must warn you, I feel the presence of the Holy Ghost. Book of Joshua uh, is a um, historical documentation of the crisis at Canaan. It is not a record of Joshua's life as it would seem because the book is entitled after him. And I, and I get the propensity and the lure to assume that the book is about Joshua's upbringing because it is named after Joshua. But historically, and don't ever forget this, Joshua is actually a continuation of Deuteronomy. Remember what happens in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel come out of bondage. Everybody say Exodus. Ex a thing. That's the book of Exodus. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a book about the matriculation of Moses and the transposition into the place where Moses has come to the end of his prophetic agenda and life and he now dies and Moses is gone and now Joshua is the new Moses. You hear people talk about the Moses generation and the Joshua generation, two totally different styles of leadership. Moses walked among the people. Joshua walked in front of the people. You got to get this because at, at some stage of leadership in your company, in your business, in your ministry, it's okay to be among the people. But when Moses was with them, they were still growing. Now Joshua is here. There are two million of them and Joshua can't counsel everybody individually. Joshua can't go to every wedding. Joshua can't go and visit all of the schools. I know that that's what they wanted from their new pastor, but their new pastor has a different mandate than their old one. Are you listening to me? And so now Joshua has a different leadership style, but this is where it gets difficult because people uh, don't give you the latitude to grow. They expect from you in big what they got from small. And they say stuff like, oh, you arrogant. Oh, you uppity. Oh, 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 you need armor bearers. Yes, because people are crazy. Are you listening to me? So you got to understand that as you grow, some people will not be able to go because they expect small out of big. See, you can't do in a neighborhood with $3 million houses what you can do in the projects. In the projects, you can have a plastic chair sitting on the front step and you can be braiding hair and, and having a boombox playing music. You, you go into a, a nice neighborhood, if you walk loud, they're calling somebody. Joshua and Moses are not the same, but here is the struggle. Joshua and Moses are not the same, but Joshua was raised by Moses, so he doesn't know he's different yet. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't know that just because he came out of that house, he's not supposed to build that house. 
He doesn't know that just because he was raised by an alcoholic doesn't mean he has to become one. He doesn't know that just because his father didn't raise him, it doesn't mean he's not supposed to raise his. He doesn't know that just because he came up in an abusive environment, it doesn't mean that he has to propitiate the abuse. Sometimes you are born in a thing that you are called to change. Touch your name and say, I'm Joshua. If you saw what I saw growing up, you'd be shocked that I'm still here. Some of y'all should be in jail, on drugs, having psychotic episodes. Well, you do, but you maintain it, but you know. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you something. Everybody in here is at least half crazy. How many of y'all agree with me? It, it, Everybody here, I mean, you at least one-fourth crazy on the weekend, half same Monday through Friday. Friday at 449, you go back to being crazy, and you know how to order your crazy back into restraint Monday at 759. An icon has just died. Do you know who Moses is? He's the emancipator of the children of Israel. He is a type of Christ, born, put in a river, left for dead, found by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in the house of the man who wanted him dead. And don't tell me that God won't allow you to have a room in your enemy's house. <laughs> Y'all missed all of that. You up here trying and praying and asking God to kill your enemies, and you don't understand that God is going to use your enemies to build your name. He's going to use your enemies to display the character that you actually have. Because once people find out who your enemies are and find out what they said about you, you don't understand that the world is going to believe the opposite because nobody's going to believe that Moses is bad listening to Pharaoh. So now Moses has a room in the house of his attempted assassin. And Moses ain't stupid because he's learning from his enemy. Moses is learning, oh, this, the, 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 the cup goes on this side, the fork goes on that side. He's learning the culture because one day he's going to be at a table. He's going to have to know the rules. And see, you got to understand that your enemies are going to show you some things. They're going to show you the rules of engagement. But, but here's the most important thing. He's an icon, but here's what the Bible says. And I, I want to get this out in the open because if I don't get it to anything else, I'm fine with that because the Bible says that Moses, my servant, is dead. Not, not Moses, my musician. Not Moses, my pastor. Not Moses, my deacon. Not Moses, my usher. Moses, my servant is dead. And the Bible says in verse 1 that Moses was the servant of the Lord. Everybody say the servant of the Lord. Now there are so many things that people hope to be in this world. There are people in this room hope to be rich. There are people in here praying to be healthy. There are people who want to be famous. There are people who want to be this and that. But I've never heard a whole lot of people saying, Lord, it is my desire to be a servant. N nobody prays, Lord, make me the best servant that ever served in service. N no nobody's praying to be a servant, but, but Moses was was a servant. Not many wished to be one, but Moses was. And Carl Frederick Kiel, the German theologian, said that the term servant is applied so frequently to Moses that history bequeaths him with the idea that servant is actually his real name. That he's been called servant so much that it's his official title. Everybody say servant. 
This is the shadow and the type of Jesus and Moses because Jesus shows us, listen, that service is actually a success strategy. That service can get you indoors, your degrees can't. I'm talking because, listen, because we got a whole generation of people who want to go to college, but they don't want to serve. We got a whole group of people who are online going back to school and going back to get degrees. And let me tell you something, service can bring you to a table that a GPA cannot get you to. Service can get you indoors that money cannot buy you through. Service can put you in the company of great men that your talents cannot do. I'm looking for somebody who understands that service is a success strategy. Everybody wants to be served, but nobody wants to serve. And it's amazing how some of us, how much we expect from our servers. Have you ever been with somebody who goes in a restaurant and yells at the server for how the food came out as if they cooked it? Uh-uh. This ain't what I ordered. I asked for no barbecue sauce. Get this out of my face. We treat servants so bad. And the reason why we treat servants so bad is because we don't know what it's like to be treated bad as a servant because we don't serve. But if you ever serve somebody, it puts something in your heart. Come here. It puts something in your heart. When that servant comes to the table, you understand that their payment is never the money because servants are never paid well by people who don't serve. But when you've ever served somebody, you tip them more than is expected. When you've ever served somebody, you understand and you say stuff like, oh, baby, don't worry about it. It ain't your fault. The only reason why you've ever treated a servant bad is because you ain't never served nobody. That's why your marriage don't work, because it ain't about making love. It's about making service. Y'all better holler at me. I I'll, I'll fight every one of you. That's why the person got promoted over you and you've been working there longer and you got a better degree and you got all of the tenure. Yes, but they were a servant. So that's your name say, give me Bible then. So I don't want your opinion. Keep your opinion to yourself. Give me Bible. John chapter number two. The Bible says there was Jesus' first miracle at a wedding feast called at Cana of Galilee. And the Bible says that there was 120 to 180 gallons of wine. And the Bible says over the seven-day feast period, they had drunk all the wine, which means that everybody was bent. Because let me tell you something, if 180 gallons of wine disappear, everybody getting tipsy. How let you, come on. You don't, you don't drink 180 gallons of wine and walk out under your own power. Everybody called an Uber. Everybody called a Lyft from the first miracle of Jesus. And the Bible says that they drunk it all. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. He says, listen, I want y'all to fill the water pots. This is what Mary says. And then Jesus says, uh, my hour has not yet come. In other words, he said, mama, it ain't my time yet. She said, boy, who, who I brought you in this world. I take you out. Now, I said, perform this miracle. She said, whatever he says, do it. Jesus said, thanks for get on my nerve. Bring me the water pots. So they pick up the water pots and they bring them over to where Jesus was. And the Bible says that the water turned into the wine and nobody saw it except for the servants. Y'all better hear me. Which means that Mr. and Mrs. of the marriage didn't see it. The 12 disciple church folks, they didn't see it. The only people who saw the transformation were the ones who didn't have too much arrogance to serve. And when the servers started serving, they saw the transformation. God told me to tell you, you will see a transformation in your life when you serve somebody.
Ask your neighbor, how may I serve you? How may I serve you? No, this is a serious question. How may I serve you? Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything that I can pray for? Is there any way I can help you? We're always looking to be served. But the water only turns to wine in your life when you do the serving. My whole life is service. I got a chance, my wife and I got a chance, we went um, to a restaurant and we sat down and we saw a man who was the owner of Best Buy, 53 years, worth five plus billion dollars. And we sat and talked with him for an hour. And I said, sir, I could not be around you without asking a question. And he said something to me so phenomenal. He said, thank you so much for asking me a question. You see, that's the difference between a server and somebody who's not. Servers don't get annoyed when people need help. I said, sir, what did you do to get to this level in your life? I can't leave your presence without finding out your secret. He looked at me and my wife and said, my secret is service. He owned the resort where we, are, we were at. He says, my job is to make sure that I serve everybody here. And he said at Best Buy, my job there is to make sure that I serve all of the clients there. This is a true story. I'm walking and, and there's some wasps that are, that are circling around me. Now, I'm from the hood, so I know you ain't supposed to swat at them, but anybody like me, they come around me, I'm swatting at them. I don't care, bees, sw I'm, I swatted. So I took one of them, I hit him, pow! Knocked him all the way across to another couch. I went to go over there to finish him off. Because you just can't, so you gotta finish him off. Come on now, I know it's a little more. I mean, when I, when I kill one, it needs to know. It shouldn't have been swimming around me. So I go over there to kill him, but he called his homeboy, he said, zzz, 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 and then they came out. Pow, pow. They stung me on the inside of the ankle, on the outside of the ankle. My leg swole up front, but I got him. I got him. It was worth it because I got him. Now, I'm, I'm swelling up. The wasp has stung me. The GM of the resort says, stay there, Mr. Henderson. He goes and get antibiotic wipes and antibiotic cream. He brings it to me. I'm getting ready to put it on. He said, no, it is my pleasure to serve. Here he is rubbing my ankle. I was like, you know, I could have did it myself, but hey, you want to go ahead, bro. And, and now, now watch this, he's eating. He stops eating to ease my discomfort and then takes all of the furniture, flips it over and washes it down to make sure that nobody else gets stung. I am definitely going back to a place where a manager will stop eating to take care of a pain he doesn't have. And that's all service is. Seeing about a pain that doesn't hurt you. Y'all better hear me. Some of y'all can't act until you hurt, but you got to see about a pain that doesn't bother you. Service. And now I'm sold on a place all because of a sting. I didn't say I was going back for the oxtails. I didn't say I was going back. Well, I didn't drink no cocktails. They had them, but they was around there somewhere. Somebody was drinking them, but I didn't say I was going back for that. I seen a few of them out there, you know. I didn't say I was going back for the mattresses or the pillows. I said, for the service. I try to teach our staff all the time. Somebody comes in here and they say, hey, I got to use the restroom. You don't tell them over there, you take them. You take them to the restroom, five-star service, best you can. Now, you can't get everybody to do it because sometimes the excellence is difficult to get it from the leader to the follower. 
And here's, here's where your life will change. Your life will change when you spend the rest of your life making sure that everybody in it has the same definition for excellence that you have. Is this making sense to anybody? Touch two people and say, you can serve your way there. I hope I'm helping you. Because Joshua didn't get this job because of his GPA. He did not get this job because he went to an Ivy League school. He did not get this job because he was born into the aristocracy. He got this job because he was a servant. You'd be surprised who would pick you if you would pick service. I'm speaking over your life that when you get to work tomorrow that you don't walk in like somebody owe you something and you don't walk in with an attitude and you don't walk in late wondering why you don't get promoted. Get there early and serve and see what God will do in your life. Now I know you ain't gonna say man because you think everybody owe you something but I'm just talking to the remnant in here who believes that the words that are coming out of my mouth are prophetic and when you get to work tomorrow you're gonna walk in with a different attitude and not, a, not an attitude of expectation but an attitude of service. And I know you're the boss, but you weren't hired to run it. You were hired to be the lead servant. You don't get to sit in your office and eat Raymond noodles all day long. Raymond, Roman, whatever you want to call them. I don't know where you get Roman. Ain't no O on the whole box, but it's all good. We've been saying, you want some Roman noodles? <laughs> Somebody say, Joshua served. Joshua served. Now, I want to show you something. Y'all still with me? Canaan, listen, this is, this is important. Canaan was pursued under Moses, but it was only possessed under Joshua. This is important. Moses went after it and couldn't get it. Joshua wasn't going after it and he got it. Okay, all right. Oh God. Now I, I know I don't say a whole lot of great stuff, but that was so good I got to say it again. Moses went after it but couldn't get it. Joshua wasn't stutting it. That's a word, ain't it? But he got it. How does a man who was going after it not get it? And a man who wasn't going after it. It was pursued under the management of Moses, but it was possessed under the jurisdiction of Joshua. And here's the reason why. Moses could not go into the promised land because he allowed anger to cause him to mismanage his moment. Lord, help me. He couldn't manage himself when his anxiety got going. He couldn't manage himself when his attitude got tri You know, everybody, you know that 50% that I was just talking about. So he mismanaged it. So God says, here's Moses, what I want you to do. I want you to speak to the rock. And Moses speaks to the rock and water comes out. Now, he wasn't frustrated that time. The next time God says he wants him to speak to the rock, he's frustrated because they done made him mad. And now he gets to the rock and he strikes it. And he expects water to come out of the rock even though he disobeyed God. And God says, I cannot trust you in the promised land. Not because I don't love you, but I can't trust your temper. Hmm. You got the education to be the manager, but you don't treat people right when your temper gets... You, you got the expertise to be the supervisor, but see, you hold grudges, and you got favorites, and when you get to management, it got to be about the objective and not about your clique. Come here. Somebody say next level. 
you up here asking God to put you over the company, but you got to have a certain mindset to be over things. When you are over things, you can't be petty. When you are over things, you can't try to get even. When you are over things, you can't strike employees you're supposed to speak to. So God says, I want to, I want, I want, I want to put you over it, but you still ghetto. You ratchet. And if I put you over the thing, you're going to have people you like in the office and people who you don't like in the trash can. And so I'm going to keep you on the level you're on because you are a striker and not a speaker. Come here. Come here. Don't go to sleep. Tell your neighbor this, this mess, this bud's for you. This one's for you. Come here. Can y'all feel my finger on your pulse? I know what you want, but you got to have a temperament to manage it. So he says, Moses, you're not going. I love you. Thank you for your services. I appreciate what you've done over the last 40 years, but here is where we stop. Because you had 40 years to get ready for this moment, and you did not. That's why God will never feel bad about not taking you to the next level, because he will always give you enough time to get ready for it. Moses, this is it. We ain't going no further together. Thank you, bro. You had a nice life. Look at what I saved you from. You could have been dead a long time ago. It's Joshua's turn. And you're not going in, not alive. I can preach a whole sermon about how we got in dead. But you're not going in alive. And he says, and I'm not going to be responsive to your academic intelligence. I'm going to be responsive to Joshua's emotional intelligence. Are you listening to me? So he says, Moses is gone, but Joshua gets a chance to see what God has for him. Can I just, I want you, I want you to put this word in your spirit. Just repeat after me. I'm going to live to see it happen. We put that in your spirit. Because that's, that's the end. Now we're going to reverse engineer and go back so I can show you how you're going to live to see it happen. Because if you do the Moses thing, expecting the Joshua outcome, you're not going to live to see it happen. Joshua was raised by the man who didn't make it in which means he had every propensity to do the same action. But something in his spirit said, that ain't how you do that. Has, has your spirit ever, I mean, you don't always get it right, but has your spirit ever said to you, you need to do better than that? How many of y'all have ever just been disgusted with yourself? Let me see your hands. Now, for those of y'all who didn't raise your hands and you've never been disgusted with yourself, God ain't happy because the Bible says our best is but filthy rags in his sight are you listening to me you cannot be impressed by you you literally have to be disgusted by you because it is only when you are weak that God can become strong you can't be impressed by yourself oh I used to cuss him out and I didn't cuss him out good now try not to do it more than one week just because you didn't cuss somebody out one time don't mean you grew. <laughs> I'm growing because I normally would. Well, we, we will know you grow when you continuously do. Tell somebody, say, I'm going to live to see it happen. Joshua's task as an Israeli leader was extremely difficult. He's following in the footsteps of an icon. He's following in the footsteps. So you know that when you follow in the footsteps of somebody that they liked, you, you're going to have trouble getting in there. So, so, so anytime Joshua tells them to do something that Moses didn't require, they, they, you, know, you can hear him complaining. See, that's, that's why I like Moses, because Moses didn't move as fast as Joshua. Moses didn't make us get better. 
like Joshua. Can you hear? I don't know what the complaint was, but they were saying something. And, and so as they were complaining, and he's leading the people into the place, when they get there, this is good. Now watch this. When they get to uh, Canaan, you got to read the Bible, and you read it when we read it. The Bible says that there are like a whole lot of armies there, and they ready to fight. So you got all of these Jebusites, Canaanites, Amorites, Gergesites, they're all there like, oh, they coming. Y'all ready? Let's mount up. Y'all ready? Y'all got the left. I got the right. We got the back. They ready to fight. And the children of Israel, they thinking they coming in because they've been in slavery for 400 years. They've been in the wilderness for 40. They think they about to go and get a rest. Because, you know, after you fought for a long time, the one thing you're asking, God, just give me a season. Well, I ain't got to fight nobody all my life. I had to fight. I had to fight my mama. So they think that because they've been through 440 years, they're about to get to rest. But they don't understand what you now know. The first thing you have to do when you come up on the promise is fight for it. Hmm. Don't miss it. I, I don't know who told you this, but this ain't no season of rest. Who told you? With the economy doing what it's doing. Who told you when other countries are, if you, you see other countries coming together, do you see the message of a global currency? Do you see a, a bad fellows getting together and you see China and Russia and Brazil and you see all other countries coming together? Don't you see the writing on the wall that something is happening all around us and you think this is the time to rest? This is the time for you to get your portfolio diversified. This is the time for you not to have all of your money in depreciating assets. Talk to me. This is the time for you to be cash heavy because let me tell you something. He who has the money controls the opportunity. Are y'all listening to me? I, I know you want bags and purses and shoes, but if a war break out, you can't sell shoes to people who ain't got money. Are you watching? Or are you so frustrated with the temperament that you turn off the television and you go eye blind to it and you act just because and you think that just because you didn't see it, it ain't happening. You don't see it. Do you see it? Do you see what's happening on the Internet? Do you see that we are on our 170th mass shooting already this year? You don't see it? Because when you are asking God for the promise, you better be ready to fight for it. The mistake that we think that we make is that when we pray and ask God for new territory, we think it's going to be Wakanda. It's going to be Iraq. Ain't no vibranium. There's a war going on. Do you hear me? There's a war going on. There's an educational war going on. Do you see how our children are falling back every year? We go from being third to fifth to sixth. And here we are. We just happy that our streets are paved. And we happy because we live in our suburbs and we got our little nice houses. And we happy because we're getting our little checks from our job. Meanwhile, our children are in the eighth grade reading on fourth grade levels. Come on, y'all. Holler at me. Meanwhile, we've got all kinds of abbreviated text messaging systems that are robbing our children from the ability to spell. They don't know how to write in cursive. They don't know arithmetic. They don't know Pythagorean theorems. They don't know calculus, stuff that we knew. Doing addition in the eighth grade? Meanwhile, you go online and you found, find childhood geniuses in other ethnicities four years old solving mathematical problems. Ain't no more spelling bees. All we want to be is athletes and rappers. 
are influencers and you're gonna get your head knocked off going in these stores acting crazy with these people trying to get some views, you better be careful. Do you see what's happening? Or, or, or do we not see that this is a different generation? And Moses is dead. And artificial intelligence is alive. Did y'all come to hear a sermon or did you want to be entertained? Because I could do either one, but I'm trying to get you to the next level. Do you not understand that if you don't bring your creative genius back, you're going to be working for a computer instead of the computer working for you? I would suggest instead of buying five pair of Jordans a month, you find out where they make them from, start your own store and you sell them. Like my cousin did. He knew there was a market for exclusive shoes. And so instead of spending his money on wearing them, he spent his money on buying them. And now he can buy them because people buy them from him. I wonder how many conversations do we have with our children like I'm having with you right now? Well, you make sure that your children know the difference between a five and a 10 and a 20. To make sure they're not getting cheated when they get changed. See, y'all don't want to hear this kind of preaching no more. The reason why I got to do this is because this stuff ain't in a lot of people's houses. So now I got to be a pastor and a father and a financial advisor. And y'all just, y'all just oblige me right now because there are some people who will never hear this stuff from nobody in their family because nobody in their family ever graduated from high school. Nobody ever went to college. So why are you sitting up here talking about move on? They sit here saying, feed me until I want no more because I know that God has something for my life and I got to get to the place where I can step on it. I'm coming. Israel today is still at war from what I'm preaching about. They haven't solved it yet. You know why? Because they were God's chosen people. And I want to go on record to understand that America has to be careful because every nation that ever came up against Israel is no more. I want to go on record by saying that the Byzantine Empire, no more. The Roman Empire, no more. The German Empire, no more. The Spanish Empire, no more. Every generation of people that came up against God's chosen people. Remember, he said, Abraham, I will bless them that bless you and I will. Don't y'all play with me, I know my Bible. I will curse them that curse you. When God is for you, <laughs> when God is for you, when God is for you, you can kill a giant with one stone. When God is for you, you can be thrown in a pit and left for dead and somebody just happened to be taking a walk past the hole you're in. When God is for you, you can walk around fire and not burn up. When God is for you, you can walk around in a lion's den and not get bit. When God is for you, Touch three people and say, that's why I ain't dead, because God is for me. They tried to kill me. It ain't that they didn't try. It's that God was for me. It ain't that I didn't get the STD. It's that God was for me. It ain't that I did everything right. It's because God was for me. When God is for you, you can be swallowed up by a fish and then find yourself on dry land because you prayed. And I don't know who I'm talking to in here today, but God told me to tell you, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is getting ready to come in the morning. Matter of fact, I want you to put a declaration in the atmosphere and let every devil and witch and warlock and soothsayer know that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. If I'm talking to somebody in this building online today, I want you to open up your mouth and give them 12 seconds of praise. Slap somebody who got a smile on their face and say, the devil should have killed me when he had a chance. But he done messed around and let me make it to the sanctuary and recognize that every place my foot shall tread, God is going to give it to me. God said, I'll give you the authority to tread on serpents' heads. Everybody pick your foot up and just step on
How many of you know it's your time? It's your time. It's your time. It's your time. Tell your neighbor, I'm, I'm not trying to be selfish, but I'm just telling you it's my time. I've been praying for people all of my life, but it's my season. I've been hoping for others all of my life, but it's time for me and my babies to get a break. It's time for me and my house. Moses is dead. What I'm trying to tell you is that the way you used to do things has expired. The method that brought you to this place in your life will not work where you're trying to go. Manipulation worked in one season. It ain't working because where you are now, people are too smart. The spending habits you got, they don't work where you're going. You know that rough side of you that just talks to people crazy? You can't do that where you're going. They don't respond where you're going. And that's how you know you've come to a different place. It's when your methods stop working. Some of y'all in relationship right now, you can't figure out why can't I? That method don't work no more. They grew beyond where you met them. Are you listening to me? That method is done. Thank you. I'm, I'm serious. I can't, I can't tell y'all how serious I am. I can't tell you how serious I am. You, you can't walk in the boardroom the same way you walked in the classroom. I'm telling you. I'm telling you what I know. I had to make a fundamental shift in the way I saw the world. Otherwise, the world was going to leave me behind. Ignite school and superintendents and the whole team sitting on the front row. They not connecting with a church that doesn't have structure. They're not partnering with a church that just has a secretary and no vision. There's a whole machine behind that wall you don't see. There's a level of excellence that has to take place every day and expertise every day in order to partner with a company that has how many schools around the world? 90. Matter of fact, I don't know who this is for, but God said you're going to have 90 locations. I don't know who that's for. Just, just touch somebody and say, that's for me. 90 locations. I'm going to be I'm going to be in Florida. I'm going to be in New York. I'm going to be in Massachusetts. I'm going to be somebody shout 90 locations. Now, if you don't have the face for that, sit down and keep looking ashy. But I need 90 of y'all to start shouting 90 locations. 90 relationships, 90 deposits a month. Somebody shout 90. Thank you. See, this is why I got to be obedient. And God said, he says, I'm going to give you the vision for it in 90 days. See, normally I would let that go and I wouldn't say it because I would be afraid. But devil, back up off me. I'm in the flow of the prophetic. God said in 90 days, I'm going to give you the strategy on how to expand yourself 90 times. Moses is dead. How will you know when your Moses is dead? Number one, your circle will get smaller. I will. Me and you, let's get it. Your circle, how many of y'all just, you don't even like the people you used to like? You look at them and be like, ugh, get on my nerve. I love you, baby. How many y'all, I'm serious. How many, you, you, the people you used to go to lunch with at work, now you like, I'll pack my lunch. I'll eat by myself. 
when you see their name on your call ID, you like. Because when God is taking you to the next level, the first thing he does is cut your circle down. There were two million of them. Oh, I got Bible. Y'all don't want to hear me. Who were the two spies that were sent into the land and came back with a majority report and they were the only two to survive long enough to see it? Caleb and Joshua. The issue with some of us is who trying to drag people in who wasn't invited. You gonna kill your business trying to do business with a person who ain't a businessman. You gonna kill your dream trying to connect with a nightmare. There are only certain people who can go where you're going. I'm flowing in the prophetic. Do y'all hear me in the balcony? Do you hear me on the back row? I don't wanna talk to nobody who's sleeping. Who's listening to me? And when he cuts the circle, you stop reviving it. Let it die. Oh, the Bible says they all died. Am I right, Pastor Torrance? They all died in the wilderness. Because the same God that sustained Caleb and Joshua could have sustained them if they would have had the mind that Caleb and Joshua had. And here you are trying to make something live that God's trying to kill. And if you mess around and get them in Canaan, they're going to turn it into Egypt. Some of y'all right now, listen, your circle is just... And it's hard. It'll make you cry. It'll make you feel lonely. Talk to me. Now, I know, now let's not just act like it's just easy. Here you are looking on Instagram, and they went out and didn't even call you, and, and, and you, you introduced them. Now, here they are popping bottles on IG, and you at the crib watching Netflix and chilling alone. Look at me. One of the ways you know that God is taking you to the next level is when they no longer invite you. Whenever the invitation slowed down, it's God's way of letting you know I'm speeding you up. And some of y'all heart broke. Because you thought y'all were going to be friends forever. And that's your girl because y'all went to high school together. And y'all beat a couple of people up together. And, 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 and you disobeyed your mama for him. Yeah, I'm going to be messy all You stopped going to Christmas for him. You done cut your whole family off and now you don't know how to go back and say y'all was right. Swallow your pride and go back and say, Mama, I'm so sorry. I don't know what had come over me. I know what it was. It was my Moses season. But I'm walking into my Joshua jurisdiction, and I'm ready to get what God has for me. The next way you know that God has taken you to the next level is the people who compete with you start to get uncomfortable. Man, Khalil, I'm going to preach. Jackie, I'm going to preach. Sarge, I'm going to preach. I don't care. Y'all are the only ones looking at me. I'm just calling the names of the people who are looking at me, looking like y'all are interested. The rest of them, I wish you had move on. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. Your competitors start to get uncomfortable around you. You ever been around people, they can't, they can't look at you like they used to. Just... Ah, ah, I got you. Uh-huh, I know what that is. You know why 
Moses's, uh, Joshua's competitors were upset with him? It's because they knew he was next even when he didn't. See, when people start to mimic you, they're saying you're next. Appreciate them for recognizing your talents and your gifts instead of being angry with them. Thank God. Because here's the problem with most of us. We think it will be our friends that show us who we are. You don't know who you are by the level of friend you have. You learn who you are by the level of enemy you have. Your enemies tell you who you are. You know why they knew Jesus was the Messiah? Because everybody was trying to kill him. You know why they figured out it wasn't John the Baptist? Because nobody was bothering him. And the reason why most people don't bother you is because they don't know you. It's not because they're, you're not anointed. It's they don't know you. You ever do anything to get known, they're going to talk about you too. One, I love Lonnie. Lonnie is one of my favorite people. Lonnie will text me every once in a while, and he'll say to me, he'll say, Pastor, stay on the wall, man. Stay in your focus. Stay on your grind. Me and my wife, we got you and your wife in prayer. And he texted me the other day, and he was like, God told me to tell you this, and he told me to tell you that. And he says, and don't worry about this, and don't worry about that. And I text back to him. I said, bro, I didn't even know nobody said nothing. Because I don't live where I can hear crabs. I don't even live that low. I didn't even know nobody was hating. I didn't even know nobody was talking because the air up here is positive. Touch on that. I breathe positive air. I don't even know what they saying down there. I don't even know. I don't read comments to find out what you got to say about me. If I'm ever going to learn what you had to say about me, it's because we got a relationship where you can say it to me. I'm not going to look for negativity. I don't read comments. I block them. I protect my space. I protect my head because I know if I let it in there, I can't get it out. So I block you so you can't disturb me. So I said, was this yesterday? Day before yesterday? I said, I didn't even know. I don't live down there. My friends ain't down there. I don't even know what's happening down there. I'm up here. I think on these things. I stay prayed in the spirit. I stay listening to music that lifts my spirit. I stay around people that lift my spirit. And if I get around negativity, I walk away from it. And this is how I fight my battles. I wouldn't even know a competitor if I saw one because the only person I'm fighting against is the last version of me. If you get better than you, you won't have to worry about being better than them. You know another way that you notice God's taking you to the next level? Your concerns get bigger. Listen to me. If your problems ain't growing, neither are you. Did you hear me, young lady? The signal that you will know that you're getting bigger is the problems you have to solve are getting larger. And if your problems are still the same size, so are you. You have to be called to solve big stuff. But you can't solve big problems if you're a small person. Somebody say, Lord, grow me. Because when you grow, you can handle big stuff. Is this helping anybody? I said, am I helping anybody? Now listen to me, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Whose attention do I have? 
online, show me your hands if I'm talking to you because I'm telling you what I'm about to say right now is getting ready to change your life. Who's listening? Just because your concerns get bigger doesn't mean you have to be more concerned. <laughs> Just because your problem's getting bigger and your concerns get bigger don't mean you have to be concerned more. That's a trick of the enemy. I got the same level of concern for my big stuff that I got for my little stuff. You know why? Because God going to handle it all anyway. So I don't increase my concern because my tax increase. I stand still. And I see the salvation of the Lord. Now, here's why this is hard. Because God don't solve his problems as quick as I want them solved. They attack me on Monday. I want God to handle it Monday afternoon. God said, I might not handle this to December. But when you get to December, and you see everything I did between March and December, you will say what David said, it was good. That I was afflicted because God has a big idea. His ways are not your ways. Can you tell I came ready for you today? Just because your concerns get bigger doesn't mean you have to be concerned more. Don't you stress yourself out over things you cannot change. Don't let the devil do you like that. Don't let the devil do you like that. You're gonna be stressed out and you're not gonna be able to enjoy your life. And you're going to be angry all the time. And you're going to have toxic thoughts. And let me tell you what happens when you struggle that way. It manifests in the physical. And it ain't nothing worse than being physically sick and emotionally sick at the same time. Now, that's called suicidal thoughts. Now you don't want to live because if you go mental, you're sick. If you go physical, you're sick. If you go spiritual, you're sick. And now you're boxed in and you say, I just want out of here. You got to be healthy somewhere so you can turn to that area and sustain yourself until God works the other area out. Who am I talking? I Sometimes I feel bad when I get here. I feel bad because it just keeps coming in my head and I keep pouring and, and I'm, I'm coming up against the resistance of Satan and his imps who want the sermon to be over and we are almost at the place where breakthrough is about to happen and it's about three devils in here right now that's trying to push me back. I bind you in the name of Jesus. Get off of me. Bible says that when Joshua got to the Jordan River and it was time for him to go over it, the Bible says that it was full. At the time Joshua gets to the Jordan River, it's flooded. So normally when he got to the Jordan River, and I want the Jordan River to be a metaphor for your problem. Normally when he got to the Jordan River, the Jordan River, anybody ever seen, I've been baptized in and seen, if you go over there, the Jordan River is about waist deep. So normally he could wade in the water. Normally, you could walk through the Jordan River, but at the time that Joshua's there, he's in over his head. And so now he's afraid to go because the thing that he used to walk through, now he's got to. So sometimes the devil will keep you on the other side of the miracle because you're afraid of deep things. He'll keep your marriage on the other side of happiness because you don't ever have a deep conversation. Everything is always surface. And so now Joshua is at a place where he's in deep. And his problem is bigger than the last time he saw it. And that's how you know that God has called you to be the liberator because the thing that you used to handle is bigger the next time you see it. 
and your expectation is that over time it will get easier. And God said, no, baby, what I got for you, over time it's going to get bigger because you got to be big enough to handle it. And if I leave the problem small, you will continue to shrink. So I'm using the problem to grow you. He's the God of the mountain, but he's also the God of the valley. I feel deliverance in this room. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying, man. I'm trying. Lord, help me right now. Jesus, help me. Lord, help me. He said, he said, Joshua, arise and go. God, you ain't even going to take into account what just happened. I just lost my mentor. I'm frustrated and you want me to work? They did me wrong and you want me to apologize? I ain't say nothing about them. They, they came for me. And God, you know how I, I deal with people. They come for me. I come for them, Moses. Now you're going to be Moses or you're going to be Joshua because the way you used to do things, they come for you, you come for them. But if you're going to be Joshua and get into this promised land, they're going to have to come for you and you come for me. I said, listen. God says, listen, man, I called you, Joshua. I'm almost finished. I called you, but I did not tell you this was going to be comfortable. I did not promise you that. And don't want Moses' job if you don't want Moses' pain because you saw his glory, but you didn't know his story. Moses went through a lot. Remember, Moses had to look out a window and see the Egyptians mistreating his people. So he had, he didn't have to, but he did. He killed the man and then buried him in the backside of the desert. Like, you ain't going to treat my people like that. And God called him anyway. So he says, listen, I didn't tell you this was going to be easy. I didn't tell you that if you got in this situation, it was going to be calm. Now, those were your expectations. And since when do I have to meet yours? Since when did I have to make the situation match what you imagined? You should have consulted me first and asked me what came with that, and I could have told you it was going to be more difficult than you imagined. But because you went after it without asking me, now you got to watch me work. Here go Joshua, trying to get through that water. Listen to this. How many people have ever wanted to ask me this question, or some of you all have? Pastor, how do you know when it's your time? How do you know when it's your season? How do you know when it's the thing that God wants you to do? If you want that question answered, raise your hand. You can find this for yourself, but I'm going to give it to you. There's a man named Joseph Parker. He said, listen, do not force the gate open that is closed to you. For there is plenty to do on this side of the gate. But in due season, the gate will open as if an invisible angel had touched it. And by the falling back of the gate, you will know that the opportunity has come. A long way of saying that is, you will know it's your direction because the door will open without you having to touch it. Any area of your life where you got to keep forcing your way through the door is not your direction. Change course and try to find another way in. And this is why most of us are frustrated is because we keep trying the same two or three things over and over again and you don't get creative to find another way in. Watch this. I'm going to give you a story. I got a friend named Gardner Parker. He's 81 years old. I like being friends with old people because they got wisdom. 
He married a woman that had children. The children had a father, obviously. He's got children. He's their father. So anybody knows that sometimes it's difficult to blend a family. And every morning, because the way he went to work, he took her children to school. And, and he felt like the children didn't like him because he would drive them to school and they wouldn't speak to him ever. For months, he drove them to school. They never even said good morning when they got in the car. He took them to get breakfast. They didn't say thank you. For months. Now, he, he, was, he was frustrated. It was causing friction in his relationship. So this is what he did. He says, oh, I can't get in that way. So I'm going to get in another way. So what he does is he buys a billboard. He got money. I know that you don't do this, but you know. He bought a billboard, put the three kids' picture on the billboard, and had the billboard say, good morning. And he was still frustrated for three months because for three months, the kids would be in the car with their heads down on the phone, and they never saw it. And, and he was still frustrated because now he spent all of his money on the billboard to say good morning to kids who won't say good morning that didn't even see he said good morning. Yeah. Until one day they got to school. And the kids in the neighborhood said, bro, your daddy is off the hook. I love your stepdad. Did you see the, the billboard? They're like, what billboard? You didn't see the billboard? So now they're the most popular kids at school because he bought a billboard that said good morning and it broke the ice. He says the next morning the kids get in the car and they say good morning because he found out that the way for them to like him is to make the bullies like them to make the kids like them. He could have stopped, but he was creative to, enough to understand that his Moses tactic wasn't working. So he tried a Joshua tactic and got a Joshua result. And if you don't learn that sometimes it ain't your words, it's the billboard. You better hear me. Find another way in. You're not going to shop and be happy. You're going to have buyer's remorse. It ain't going to work. I don't care how many pair of shoes you buy, it's not going to work. Anybody know how, how amazing you look and stuff in the store, but then when you get home, it don't look the same? You ain't got them lights. You ain't got the mirrors. You was in the mirror at the store like, oh, this is going to kill him. I'm going to kill him at the club with this. And then you get home, you're like... Ugh. You got to try to find another way in. You will know it's your season when you get to the gate and it opens as if an invisible angel touched it. I speak right now, some of y'all are going to walk into work tomorrow and that thing that's been blocking you is just going to open. Some of y'all are going to lay down tonight in the bed and that block that's been keeping you in a mental fog, it's just gonna lift. That anxiety and that depression, it's just gonna come off you. Somebody said, but you gotta wait your moment. And he says, here it is, Joshua. You can stand, I'm done. He says, you gotta be courageous. You gotta be courageous. You got to be strong. Somebody said, Lord, give me strength. So you got to be courageous because let me tell you, <laughs> the enemy is courageous. He's strong. He says, but as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I'm not going to fail you. <laughs> I'm not going to leave you behind. And even though you don't understand what I'm doing, doesn't mean I left you behind because you know we can always read the message wrong. We think that God isn't for us because he's not working it out the way we want him to work it out. He says, no, I haven't left you. I just understand the whole picture. I know what your enemies are doing in Canaan. You don't because you haven't gotten there yet. 
I know what your kidneys want to do. I know what your heart wants to do. I know what your liver wants to do. I, I know that diabetes is coming up, so I'm doing things. You don't understand, I'm trying to block something and save something at the same time. If you just let me do it, I'm doing it. If you just let me handle it. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat was getting ready for war. And they were getting ready to fight. How many of y'all ever got ready to fight? Like really ready to fight. Like you went home and changed clothes, put Vaseline on your face, took earrings out your ear, put your hair in the bun. Holler at me. Come on now. I ain't talking about one of them impromptu fights. I'm talking about, oh, you won't? Okay, I'll be back. <laughs> got ready to fight. Jehoshaphat went out there, was ready to fight. And because God knew what was going on, the Bible says that when he got out there, they were already dead. If you just let God handle it, they'll die. You won't have to kill them. And when they die, it's called natural causes. When you kill them, it's called murder. Everybody say, be strong. He says, now that I have you in a position where you trust me, and now that I have you in a position where you hear my voice and you won't question it, and now that I've got you emotionally healthy and you trust me, he says, now every place your foot shall tread, I'll give it to you because I can trust you with it. Some of y'all been stepping on stuff for years and he ain't gave it to you. God says, I'll give it to you when I can trust what you will do with it. I want to see how many people will be honest and raise your hand and say, I know he can't trust me yet. That's the reason for the delay. God is swifter than fast, quicker than right now. And I can show you countless opportunities in the Bible where the Bible says, and immediately and straightway. He can do it quick, but if he can't trust you, he does it slow. If you're in this room today, and I don't want to, because if we get at this altar, we'll never leave. I just want you to lift your hands and just begin to pray in the spirit and say, Lord, I want you to trust me. Come on, just put it in the atmosphere. Just give me, let this mind that's in me be also in Christ Jesus. Create in me a clean heart, renewing me a right spirit. When I was a child, I thought as a child. But now that I became a man, I put away childish things we see through a glass darkly. Come on, God, talk to me. Talk to me. Enter my heart. God says, I am the vine dresser. I'm the true vine. My father, he's the husband man. God says, I'll cut it off and it'll feel like I'm punishing you, but I got to cut it. I'm, it's not a cut, it's pruning. I'm, I'm just, I'm cutting off the dead part so that you can grow. 15 more seconds. Come on, just talk to him. Because your season is here. I want to share this story with you before they sing. Kafir, there's a story about an a eagle and I don't even know why this is up here because I didn't even tell them to put this up here. I can show you my notes. I got a story about an eagle that was flying over water. <laughs> you want to get the iPad and read it? It's here. So let me get because you know people think I got an earpiece in my ear and, and things be happening. I can give it to you. I want you to look at this. I wish the camera was up here. Is it right there? Yes, sir. It's right here. Eagle's flying over the water. And as he flies over the water, he sees a mouse on the block of ice. And he swoops down to get that mouse because it's a free meal. He stands on that block of ice 
and begins to eat that mouse and rip it limb from limb. What he doesn't notice is that the block of ice is in the flowing river. And sooner or later, the block of ice is going to be near the edge of a waterfall. So he's looking and he's trying to eat. And because he trusts his wings, <laughs> he knows that he can escape at the last minute. So he keeps eating. And right at the last moment when the block of ice gets to the waterfall, the eagle spreads out his wings to fly away. But he cannot because he didn't recognize that the heat from his feet had connected him to the ice block. And when he goes to fly, the ice block drags him down. Here is the moral of the story. God says your feet are going to be so powerful in this next season that if you don't want it, don't step on it. Because he didn't know that he was so powerful that he went to go get the mouse. God gave him the ice for free. You are so strong that whatever you stand, God's going to give it to you and everything connected to it. So if you don't want it, don't step on it. If you don't want to be in a relationship, don't play with it. If you're not an entrepreneur, don't start no company. Because you're in a season of favor right now that God's going to give you every place your feet go. People say, oh God, congratulations for the school. We put our feet on it. See, when I had that vision, I also know that when you have 250 kids coming into puberty, it ain't about education only. Now it's about cliques and fights and, and classism and social. It's, 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 you, see, you, you, you just want the end result. You gotta, you gotta be able to also handle the problems. You got to have parents who are going to hold you to the, the letter of educating their children and they don't even read to them at home. By the way, education starts at home, not at school. By the way, you can't raise no child in the bed when they get up and in the bed when they get home. We need some woke parents. Our world is in trouble. You got to be in partnership with the school so that the kid knows that they can't play you against the teacher and the teacher against the principal. You got to come on, y'all. We got to get together. We got to take our community back. I'm done. Y'all done had enough of me. I know I swung uppercuts, jabs. But you survived. And maybe it's a draw. I didn't knock you out. That means that this word and you, y'all are in the same weight class. Touch your name and say, I survived it. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person who said in this room that they know at this moment they can't be trusted with what they're asking for. I pray, God, that you would eliminate the fear, that you would suppress the anxiety, that you would give us the strength and the courage to go forward and step on it. I pray, God, that houses will be ours that we didn't build, vineyards will be ours that we did not plant, business ventures will be ours that we don't have the education for, money is assigned to our name, we are wealthy and, prosper uh, and have prosperity, and we are healthy, and our families are together, and our children are protected. No weapon formed against us 
will prosper. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody come on, put those hands together and give God praise in this place today. Come on, real big. This is how I fight my battles. Oh, and this is how I fight my battles. Hug three people and tell them God's going to give you the ability to fight your battles. This is how I fight my battles. Come on, know that you're surrounded by him. And this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. You're going to survive. You're going to win. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. It may look like I'm surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. I'm safe in the arms of God. a shout of praise in this place today come on all the victorious people let the devil know that he's lost let God arise and his enemies be scattered Hallelujah. come on it's giving time make a real big noise for being able to give our ushers are going to pass out envelopes for those of you all who are watching online they're going to put up a link several different ways that you can give with information is going to come up on the lower third. I am expecting that this next seed is going to break a curse in my life. Now, listen, you don't have to believe it for you. And this is what I, this is, this is going to be so powerful. This is the first time I would say to you, and I may never say this again, that what we're getting ready to give, it's about to be so powerful that if you don't have faith, don't give. Because I, I know people say, are you crazy? Now, God, he's been taking care of this church since the day it started. I'm not, it's not us. If you don't have faith right now that what I'm getting ready to say, don't give it because you're going to have an expectation your faith can't deliver. I am telling you right now that God has showed me very clear in my spirit that he is about to increase the people who are connected to this house in a way financially that nobody in your family has ever seen ever if you believe that say amen in this place right now is the ability to pay houses off in this house right now is the ability to have wealth beyond measure in this house right now God is about to bring about two three and four different ways for all of your debt to be canceled and the gate is gonna open without you touching it if you believe it say amen And the way I know it is because the oil is flowing down. When the anointing comes down Aaron's beard, it flows. And I'm telling you right now, I am walking in the prophetic. I am walking in the blessings of Abraham. I am walking in the things that God promised my mother. And I can see it and I speak it, that it is coming off of my beard onto your robe. If you believe it, say amen. We are an anointed people. We are a blessed people and you shall never be broke another day in your life. And by the fifth of this month, I decree that all of your bills will be paid. If you believe it, say amen. Get your gift ready, because I'm about to release an extraordinary anointing that when these gifts are released, God is going to release treasures in your life. Hallelujah. Your children will not have to borrow money to go to college. Thank you, Jesus. Them credit card people, they're about to stop calling you because you owe no man nothing but to love them. Amen. If you do have a credit card, you're going to pay it off by the end of the month. No interest. Thank you, Jesus. It's too much money in this world for us not to have none. Amen. Somebody shout, I'm prosperous. Tell your neighbor, I'm rich. I'm rich. I ain't been rich long enough to give you a loan yet, but I am, because they'll start asking. I, I'm, I'm going to get there. That's my next level of grace, but right now, I'm just rich for me. All right, you got your gift? Hold it up in the air. Say, as I move towards greater, I will accept 
all divine ideas, thoughts and concepts that will connect me to my destiny. I believe that what Jesus Christ has done for me is bigger than what anyone has, can, and will do to me. And because of his full gift, I will lend to many nations and borrow from none. If you believe that, put a praise on it. Pass your gift to my right, your left. As, they get, as we finish giving, those of you in this place today, you woke up this morning and you wasn't going to come. You wasn't coming. It ain't nothing wrong with that because everybody feels like that sometimes. But you knew something kept telling you, you got to go. You got to go. This is going to be your week. This is going to be your moment. And it ain't everybody's moment all the time. Sometimes it's just yours. And then some of you all came and then something happened in this atmosphere and you said, you know what, now this is the place I've been looking for. This is where I can grow. Now, I was in the back last week walking in the mud, walking around this church as they were finishing construction and I said to myself, I got to do that more because sometimes I come to church to do, but very few times do I come up here to be. And I just came up here to be here the other day and I was walking around and all of a sudden I got to get with Kim and, and get with the architect because I saw a vision of how we can make this sanctuary larger without all of the construction that we've been talking about. I saw it just being up here, just walking around. I started knocking on walls and going in rooms and finding wasted space. And I don't know if y'all know that the ceiling goes up 25 feet higher than what you can see. In the middle, 75 feet. I started to look at all of the empty space and I said, the Lord showed me something. So if I can prove it with an architect, I figure that we can do it. And, and so what I'm saying is, is that this place is getting ready to be enlarged and we're making room for people. And if you are the people that I'm talking to and God sent you here to connect with this ministry and this is where you're going to grow and this is where you're going to raise your family and this is where you're going to grow spiritually. This is where you want to connect and become a part of our community. Wherever you are, I don't care if you're in the balcony, if you're in the back row online, they've got a link for you as well if you know that God wants to plant you in this place and you want to put your feet in this part of land I want you to come from wherever you are and we're going to praise God for your soul and for your life we want to introduce you to Jesus we want to show you how you can have life and have it more abundantly wherever you are just come and come on Lighthouse praise God for them as they come God bless you God bless you God bless you thank you thank you Come on, make it real big, real big. The bigger you are, the bigger they'll come. Come on, come on, come on. God bless you, God bless you, thank you. Thank you, man, God bless you, God bless you. Thank you, thank you. They're still coming, you're still clapping. They're coming, you clap. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Hit my luck. Thank you. God bless you. This is how I find my own. Yes, yes. The devil lost again. The devil lost again. Will there be another? Anybody else? We'll wait. If not, we're going. Is there anybody else? If you're afraid, if you're afraid, do me a favor. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. They'll take you right there. God bless you. If there's somebody else, God bless you, ma'am. She's still coming. 
If you are, let me tell you how, how our church is. If you're scared to come up here by yourself, there's somebody next to you right now and be like, I don't want to go by myself. Can you go with me? They'll go with you. Just ask them. They'll go with you. God bless you. Thank you. They'll go with you. I promise you. Is there anybody else? All right, we're going home. God, thank you for bringing us to this place. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Let your love rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of us until we shall meet again. And everybody who loves the Lord, say amen. God bless you. I love you. I'll see you next time. If you were blessed today with our worship and with the word that Pastor Kim brought forth, put it in the chat. Let everybody know, say, I'm blessed. I'm looking for your emojis. I'm looking for your response because we hope that the service today was something that was able to bless you and to help you draw closer to God and grow in your faith. Guys, we know the title of the sermon today was Step On It. And that was from Joshua 1, 1 through 8. Pastor Ken talked about waiting for your moment, obeying God's commandment, and he also talked about walking in your promise. Now, he raised a really good question when he said, how do I know that it's my time? And I'm not going to answer that question. It's in the sermon. If you want to know more about that, go back and replay it. Make sure that you shared it with somebody who need to hear this word on today to help grow and encourage their faith. Listen, guys, I also want to tell you this. Don't forget to join us for our Easter experience. That's going to be next Sunday because we made room for you. So on April 9th, meet us at 10 a.m. at the George R. Brown Convention Center. Pastor Ken is going to be there. Lady Shawnee is going to be there. Tamela Mann is going to be there. And guess what? 